I, good Lord, of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who make the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you to see. 
Gracious Spirit, heed our pleading, fashion us all anew. It's your leading that we're needing, help us to follow through. Come, come, come Holy Spirit, come. Come to teach us, come to nourish those who believe in Christ. Bless the faithful, may they flourish, strengthened by grace and Christ. Come, come, come Holy Spirit, come. Keep us fervent in our witness, unswayed by Ever grant us zealous fitness, which you alone assure. Come, 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 Holy Spirit,
Welcome to Worship at St. Giles Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you've chosen to log in to worship today. If this is the first time you've logged into the service, we especially welcome you. We hope that all who participate today will experience the grace and the presence of God, even though we're gathered for worship remotely. I want to uh, share with you just a couple of announcements this morning. First, we will be streaming a worship service on Facebook on Thursday, April the 1st, which is Maundy Thursday. The service will be a modified tenebrae worship service with scripture, hymns, Holy Communion, and the extinguishing of candles. You'll be able to log into the service just like on Sunday mornings. Music will begin at 645 and the service will begin streaming at 7 p.m. Secondly, on Easter Sunday, we'll have two services. The first will be an in-person service at 7.30 a.m., a sunrise service. It will be held on the fellowship porch. Um, chairs will be socially distanced. Congregants will be asked to wear masks. Singing is discouraged and will be led um, by staff musicians who will be singing wearing singing masks. Um, then on Easter morning at 1015 on Facebook, as usual Sunday morning, we'll be streaming a recorded Easter service. Again, music will begin at 1015 and the service will begin at 1030. Finally, this morning, we have a special announcement from the transition team. Hello, St. Giles family. This is Caroline Tatum Carter, and I am here today to let you know to save the date for April 11th for our second transition team event. Um, we really enjoyed the feedback and the interaction that we had in our heritage event. And this event on April 11th will be about our church mission. So please save the date for April 11th and more details will be forthcoming from your transition team. Thanks. As we begin our time of worship this morning, I would like to invite us to join in a time of silence wherever we are so that we might let go of what's going on around us, um, plans for this afternoon, worries of the morning, so that as we gather for worship, we might be present to God and to those with whom we're worshiping today. Please join me in the call to worship. The trumpet of the Lord sounds, calling us to examine our souls. For we have not only met temptation, we have felt its grip. The trumpet of the Lord sounds, calling us to mend our ways. For we have not only committed sin, we have felt its sting. The trumpet of the Lord sounds, calling us to rend our hearts. For we have not only witnessed forgiveness, we have felt its power. O oh, come, let us worship the Lord.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Esther, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king said to Esther, What is your petition, queen? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition. And the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. And if we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. Then, then King Osiris said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? Who has presumed to do this? Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king rose from the feast in wrath and went to the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that the king had determined to destroy him. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Look, the very gallows that Haman has pre prepared for Mordecai, whose words saved the king, stands at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in our call to confession. The psalmist wrote, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Trusting ourselves to the grace of God, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. Almighty God, you despise nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that truly repenting of our sins and acknowledging our brokenness we may obtain from you, the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord of the God said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Sisters and brothers, in Christ, all God's promises are yes. Hear the good news. Through Christ, our minds and our hearts are cleansed, healed, and renewed. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children to come a little closer to the screen right now as we begin our children's time. Today, we're reading from the Psalms. They're one of the books of the Old Testament. And maybe the best thing we can remember about the Psalms is they are like songs that we would sing. The Psalms actually can be sung in the Hebrew language. Where our, our psalm today invites us to think about how much God helps us and how much we need God's help. The psalmist said, oh, if the Lord hadn't been on our side, we would not have been able to do what we were doing. I have something I'd like to invite you to think about today. I have a big stack of books. I'm going to reach over and get them right now. 
Oh my goodness. This is a stack of big books and they are heavy and I can't stand here and hold them for very long. And I wonder if I handed them to you right now, if we were together, if you think you could hold these books up. Now you might be able to, but it sure would be a lot easier if, if one person could be on one side holding and another person could be on the other side holding and maybe a third person could be in the front and we could carry them together. My guess is you've seen this happen before. I'm going to have to put these down because they're really heavy. You've seen somebody, maybe at school or at your house, where they had to move something that was very heavy, and it took several people to pick it up. Maybe it was a big table or, or a big piece of furniture or something in your garage, and people needed to do it together. Well, that happens a lot in life, doesn't it? We need help. We need somebody else to be with us. And our story reminds us today that God is always there to help us. When we need to do something, we, God is there to help us get it done because we can't do it alone. So I want you to remember that today, that whenever there's something that's difficult for you, you can count on the fact that God is there to help. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you help us just like our friends do sometimes, just like our parents do sometimes. And we can always come to you and ask you for help. We give you thanks for your love and that you're always there for us and lift up this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Psalms. We're reading from Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away the torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many of us have ever been the person to hear a baby's first word? Maybe we had some debate about it within the family. Family members sometimes compete to see who hears that first little bit of garbled speech that sounds like a word. A Parent Magazine article once noted that babies utter their first words at 11 to 14 months when the tongue and lips gain dexterity and the brain starts to match up objects with names. And parents and grandparents and family members could hardly wait to hear that first word. I remember watching and listening closely for early signs when my children were infants. I, like other parents, did a little prodding, harmless competition, hoping that it would be my name that was spoken first or a version of it. It rarely happens like we plan, and children's first words can be revealing. They often identify objects as the first words like car or tree or maybe mama or daddy. One writer suggests that second and third born children offer utter, often utter first words that express relationships like gimme or mine. That kind of makes sense. Second or third born children have siblings around them from the beginning. It's like the story of the family in Tennessee who had five children. Their fourth child out of five was late in saying that first word, but when it came forth, it was worth waiting for. The child's first word was move. This morning, we complete our four-week series on discerning God's will. And our movement, our, our focus is movement. I know that St. Giles has some history of taking action and moving on things. Congregations with a passion for mission are usually more active than not. At the same time, it's not uncommon for churches with a passion for mission to make space for discernment. We can thank the Quaker tradition for many helpful insights. My hope along the way has been that this series has shed, has shed some light on paths of discovery for us personally and even communally 
to deepen our life with God. My intent has not been to suggest one path of discernment, but to offer a framework based on historic Christian spiritual understandings and practices, trusting that God is at work in our lives and in the world. We begin by affirming that when it comes to discerning where God is at work in us, we begin by asking, then we pause, opening ourselves to wonder, mystery, life, God. Attending and being present to the God who is always present affirms our intention to find God in all things. In week two, we reflected on the importance of listening for God in Scripture, in the wonder and beauty of creation, and even noticing God as we're concretely involved with the poor, as we practice charity and self-sacrifice, as we pray individually and communally, and as we're vulnerable for love as Christ was vulnerable for love. Last week, we addressed the notion that discerning God's will in our lives means living with tension. We all experience tension in between kinds of places, the now and the not yet unresolved issues, the unknown, and the mystery and life of God's presence within and around us. The biblical example of this is Mary pondering her experiences. It's like holding them in our soul with all the tension that comes with them until transformation occurs, until healing begins, until new life begins to emerge. And today we recognize that along the way, at some point, we take a step toward clarity, toward hope, toward God. Like an infant saying that first word, like a toddler beginning to stumble around, like a seeker taking a step on the spiritual path, we move. The poetic words of the psalmist this morning offers us an image of trust and hope that we need sometimes in order to take a step. If the Lord had not been on our side, the psalmist repeats, if the Lord had not been on our side, here's what would have happened. I've heard people say this before, and maybe you have too. In the face of health concerns, family struggle, various losses in life, People say they don't know how they could have gotten through it without the presence of God that had come to them spiritually and or through the presence of God that was made real in and through people they loved and who loved them. One biblical scholar has said that this psalm reminds us that, yes, distress and tension are never far away. Yes, ambiguity is present, but the presence of God brings courage and hope. Courage to face the distress, courage to move in life along the best path we know of God's will, and hope that as we move, we're moving as God would have us to move, trusting in God all along the way. In his novel, The Shoes of the Fisherman, Morris West writes, It costs so much to be a full human being that there are very few who have the enlightenment or the courage to pay the price. One has to abandon altogether the search for security and reach out to the risk of living with both arms. One has to embrace the world like a lover. One has to accept pain as a condition of existence. One has to court doubt and darkness as the cost of unknowing. Taking a step. It can be costly. A step of faith is usually a step into darkness, yet the psalmist tells us that darkness is as light to God. If we could see it all and be absolutely sure where our steps were going to take us, then it really wouldn't be stepping out in faith. Walking into the known is something we all prefer. It's easier when we are in control of our own destiny, or at least believe we are. But sometimes we step into the dark. Not seeing, yet believing is what Jesus asked for. He asked for trust and surrender. The letting go of the ego self in control and trusting God. One biblical scholar has said the psalmist knows there's a third player in the drama. It's not just me and my enemy or me and my health and me and my family problems, me and my personal demons. But God is at work. God makes possible life in the world. 
Some describe discernment as a waking up process where we begin to see even in the dark where God might be at work in us, in others, and in all things. The story of Esther that we read from this morning is another example of taking a step. We don't hear enough about Esther, and unfortunately, her story is only included once in the three-year lectionary cycle. Esther was a strong woman who, after her parents died, was raised by her cousin Mordecai. Under the reign of King Ahasuerus, Mordecai was a loyal but stubborn person. He'd saved the king from some assassins, but he would not bow down to the king's royal leaders. Queen Vashti was an early model of resistance to her tyrant husband and is a powerful example in her own right. As the story goes, she was banished. And after she was banished, Esther became the new queen, but the king did not know that she was of Jewish descent. The villain in the story is someone named Haman. He was one of those royal leaders and was arrogant, greedy, and hated Mordecai for not bowing down to him. Well, as the story goes, Haman convinced the king to have all the Jews of the land massacred, which would include Mordecai. Haman even had a special gallows built for Mordecai's execution. Esther then risked her life to go to the king and ask him to spare her people. In the end, the tables were turned, and Haman got what he had planned for Mordecai. Esther took a step into the dark against injustice. The Jewish people once again were faced with destruction and in the end found deliverance and hope. That Esther was queen was timely, and in the end her place of power and influence was exactly what was needed. Esther took a step. She moved. She risked her life on behalf of God and God's people. It was surely a step into the darkness, into the unknown to prevent the genocide of her people. Her sacrificial gesture was a sign of her deep trust and belief. When we're discerning God's will, we ask, pause, live with the tension, and then take a step. It may be a cautious step, and we may linger there for a while, or it may be a big step, and we move with abandon. I wonder, as we make our way closer to Easter and our celebration of resurrection, is there a step or two that God is inviting each of us? to take, maybe to reconcile a relationship, maybe a step in our job or with another responsibility that we have. We may not be ready to take a particular step, and that's okay. Invitations tend to continue to come. Maybe we just haven't found the right step to take, and that's all right too. During the pandemic, many of the steps we've taken have been about safety and in our remote spaces, we've lost some connection with people. Maybe it's time to just reach out to someone to say hello. Maybe we have a neighbor that is isolated and even if we didn't get along before, maybe we could reach out to them just to listen to their perspectives and concerns. Maybe we can reach out to one or two church members that we don't know well and just let them know we'd like to get to know them. We can also plan to offer some grace-filled words when we hand out one of the Samaritan bags that have been distributed and try to reflect on how the world might look through that person's eyes who received that bag. Maybe the step we take will be one of these, or maybe it will be to start a prayer practice for St. Giles in this time of transition. Maybe we'll volunteer to help with the children or help take care of the grounds on a work day or consider a call to serve as an elder in these significant days. For the church. Not long ago, I read an excerpt from a magazine article about a device that turns the steps into energy. I, I, I love stuff like that. Um, it's called a vibration harvesting device. The idea is that when you take steps, you create energy. One model featured a staircase with treads designed to flex up to, up to one centimeter under the weight of the commuter's footfall. Each step squashes a fluid-filled balloon underneath the tread, forcing the fluid through a tiny turbine that drives a generator and produces a current. Another model used magnets wobbling on a cantilever where vibrations cause microcurrents. 
The article talked about some who were imagining that this could be used in pacemakers so they wouldn't need batteries anymore. As you move and your heart beats, it creates energy. Taking steps toward God is our response to being open to wonder, to listening, to living with tension. Taking steps toward God is an act of trust. Taking steps toward God is not only movement, but it connects us to the creative presence and energy of God that is waiting to transform, heal, and bring new life. As we discern God's will for us individually and as a community, and as we make our way towards our celebration of resurrection at Easter, may God grant us the grace to move in new and life-giving ways. Amen. During this Lenten season and during this uh, series on discernment, we have been making our way through um, the brief statement of faith of the Presbyterian Church USA as our affirmation. So we finish that today with a final adapted part of this particular uh, affirmation of faith that's found in the book of Confessions. I invite us to join now together in our affirmation of faith. In life and death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just with the boys, let me 
As we join now together in this time of prayer, I invite us to turn our hearts and minds to God, uh, not only uh, praying the Lord's Prayer together, but um, in our time of prayer today and our times of prayer this week, to be sure to remember all the folks on the church prayer list um, that you can see in your, in your bulletin this morning. Let us pray. God of all seasons, in your pattern of things, there is a time for keeping and a time for losing, a time for building up and a time for pulling down. In the season of Lent, as we journey to the cross, help us to discern in our lives what we must lay down and what we must take up, what we must end and what we must begin. Give us grace to lead a disciplined life in glad faithfulness and with the joy that comes from a closer walk with Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. invite us to join now together in our responsive benediction. Wherever we are, whoever we are, let us never forget we are God's community. Let us share God's enduring love this week. Whoever we are, wherever we might be, we know always that Christ is alive in us. Let us share Christ's enduring light into the shadows of uncertainty this week. Now, in this moment and in every moment to come, remember we are gifted by the Spirit. Let us share those gifts of grace, of hope, of justice, of peace with the world. Amen.
Stop.